Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Alexa Developer Office Hours. Um, I'm Amanda Lang, and I'm here today, first of all, by myself. Um, uh, just saying hello to everybody. Um, I have a few announcements before we get the show started today. And let me just make sure we still have everybody on the screen. Um, first of all, just a reminder that Widgets launched last week. So we're going to be hosting a live tech talk with Karthik Ragavathi and Kai Lurch on this very topic on May 17th at 10 a.m. Pacific. So you're going to join this webinar to walk through the process of building Alexa widgets for your skills. And you're going to learn how to showcase your best multimodal experience while promoting skill discoverability. So if you've never seen a widget before, those are those great little cards that appear on your Echo Show or any kind of visual device. Um, and we have a link down below to add that to your calendars. If you want to be uh, around for that tech talk, um, if you want to check that out and learn more about how to make widgets, it'd be really, really useful for you. Uh, I'm so excited that they announced those. I can't wait to see what people make. And it's going to help a lot with discoverability or skills. And also, like, I love to fill my Echo Show up with all those like great cards and useful things. So looking forward to seeing what everybody builds. Um, Last week, Jeff hosted the Developer 101 Tech Talk, and we got really good feedback about that talk. People seem to really, really like it. So this Tech Talk was about developers and helping you understand what tools to use. If you want to learn more about that, be sure to watch that through our YouTube channel. And we're going to be posting that link in the chat as well. Um, we've got that coming up. If not, I will post it myself. <laughs> oh, there we go. There it comes. Thank you so much for posting that. Uh, that's going to be the tech talk about developer tools. We get a lot of questions about developer tooling because um, people want to know, like, what's the best IDE to use? Should I be using my web browser to develop? So I just think that tech talk will help disambiguate like a lot of those questions people have. So be sure to check that out. Um, we also just published a playlist on our YouTube channel of the helpful skill quality coach chips. Um, Jeff's been doing those weekly in previous episodes. We've, we're, we're not doing one today, but we've got a whole archive of those. So if you want to check that out, that's also alexa.design slash SQC tips. Another useful place that you can go and check out uh, the skill quality coach tips. I have so many links to share with you today. I have a, a whole list of stuff. Um, we also just published a blog written by one of our Alexa champions, Tom Hewitson. And a lot of you will find that really helpful. I read that yesterday and it's a super useful about like uh, different recommendations for uh, skills businesses. And uh, we're actually talking to another Alexa champion today about their skill business. Um, what we're trying to do is talk more with the champions of uh, folks that I help bring together um, who are successful skills developers, businesses, successful business owners, or in some cases, designers. Uh, all of those folks, uh, some of those folks happen to hang out in our chat sometimes as well, which is really wonderful. So um, they basically come together um, and talk about Alexa with us, uh, talk about their successes, what they're working on, and like how we can improve the, the development experience for everybody. So we just published that blog. Be sure to check that out. That link is also in the chat. Next week, uh, Jeff's going to be hosting next week. Um, and on the show as guests, we're going to have Melissa Kinsey and Helen Hasbin, who you may have seen in some of our tech talks. Melissa is a senior technical writer here, and Helen Hasbin is our product marketing manager. They're going to be joining Jeff to discuss the new skill building basics course. I also helped work on that, so I'm excited to hear them talk about it. Uh, it should be a really, really great discussion. If you want to check it out ahead of time, trainings and workshop page has also been posted in the chat. Sorry, there's so many links today. I Hopefully, that gives you a lot to check out and look at. Uh, that, training, that training workshop is going to cover the very basics of skill building for first timers. So if you're a brand new developer to skills and you have some development experience or even no, almost no develop experience, it'd be really useful to check out those skills development courses, see what you think, give us your feedback. Uh, they're going to be talking about that next week. So I won't talk any more about it. Um, today, we're having Rob Stanbridge from Vocala on the show. I'm going to go ahead and bring him on right now. Thanks for being patient while I got through all my announcements. Rob, how are you doing today? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, I, I already see like a lot of a lot of people in the chat saying hello. So hi from Boston. Hi, data driven skills. Uh, I see uh, I see lots of questions about stuff. So I want to get started. I'm going to get started chatting with you. And as we if we have questions, um, have you had Juliana on as a guest? Have we? I, I uh, that that's a that's a good question. <laughs> well, so Rob, first of all, uh, tell us a bit about yourself about Vocala. Um, and first of all, we know you're located um, in London, so thank you for joining us. <laughs> Gavin knows you on LinkedIn, so. Oh, good. <laughs> so tell us about yourself and your company. Uh, so my name's Rob. I'm uh, our company's called Vocala. We are a, a digital agency and a conversational AI agency, and we create applications both for the web and for Alexa. Um, so I joined uh, the company about four years ago. Um, my background prior to uh, working here was in the world of live events and experiential marketing. So I worked for global agencies that worked with um, big corporate organizations that brought people together face to face in order to kind of share, to learn, um, to exchange, to entertain, to celebrate, um, that kind of thing. But about four, just literally about three days, ago, four years ago, I joined Vocala because um, I'd worked with the founder, um, a chap called Richard Matthews um, previously, and he'd started working in the world of voice and invited me to come and join him and start working. It was at a time when uh, Alexa was kind of starting. Um, there wasn't many skill builders or applications on the service, and we were um, seeing quite a bit of good traction um, and getting introduced to Amazon team in the UK. Um, with the work we were doing. So I joined um, and started working really on what we started doing ourselves, which was building games in the time before in-skill purchases were available. Um, and so we were building a number of games and we managed to license uh, deals with some big TV show brands. So we bought um, games such as Deal or No Deal, uh, which is big in both the US and the UK, big UK shows like Pointless. Um, we work with Puzzler Magazine that make crosswords. We started working with um, talent in the UK. Um, so celebrities like Fern Cotton doing meditations, um, Jeff Stelling, who's on kind of sports shows here doing sports quizzes. Um, and we started uh, building more and more of a, a fan base and an audience and, and bringing more games to the platform. Um, but at the same time, my role really was to start working with other clients who were interested in building on Alexa. So I started um, onboarding a number of clients and we managed to work with people in the UK, um, uh, a company called Interflora who sell flowers. Um, oh. We were one of the first skills to use Amazon Pay in an Alexa skill to make a purchase of flowers. We work with Royal Navy. We work with um, Department for Health and Social Care in the UK government here. We've built something called Couch to 5K which is a, a mobile running app to get you off the couch and running 5K. Um, and we've brought that to the world of Alexa. We've done stuff with Eon Energy. We've done stuff for the kids um, uh, store as well, Kids Plus. Um, so we've been building a lot of stuff in the world of Alexa um, over these past four years. Still have our game studio where we build a lot of games ourselves and we sell them now with ISPs. We do work with clients. Um, and in the last year, we've moved into Alexa smart properties and we're working quite heavily at the moment in the senior living space and developing wow. um, a tool and a product that we're deploying um, Alexa devices into care homes and people receiving care so they can use these devices um, to interact with their carers and also be entertained and stay connected. Wow that's so much stuff it sounds like you've really like pivoted and moved whenever the Alexa business evolves you kind of jump on the newest the newest cool thing that we're doing so that's really neat. Yep. What's it what's it been like um transitioning from like a, the earlier days of the business into doing in skill purchasing types type work? Yeah, well for me it was um it was a whole new world in the world of voice. I'd never uh, when I joined um really interacted with Alexa before um and kind of so been learning over the past 4 years. I think uh when we started at the when I started when I started working we were still in the developer awards program. Um, so we were building as many skills and games as we could that were kind of uh, had high engagement, mm -hmm. that we could bring audience to, that we get retention um, because we were being rewarded through the Amazon Rewards program. 
And then obviously when Inskill Purchase came in, we started transitioning slowly from receiving uh, money through rewards to now actually having customers um, who are willing to pay to, to use our skills. So that's been a journey over the past three years, I'd say. We've done a lot of learnings. We've changed a lot of things. We've done um, lots of updates. I think one of our challenges um, before in-skill purchase were there is we wanted to give as much content and the games, there was no premium content. It was give as much away as you can to get as many users as you can. Mm -hmm. And we've slowly had to kind of pare that back now in-skill mm -hmm. purchases because yes, we want lots of users, but as a business, we want people to subscribe right. and pay for that content. So there's mm -hmm. this fine line between giving content away uh, and people playing our games, um, as well as them now people willing to pay to play our games as well. So we're right. trying to learn that balance always ongoing as we uh, continue to develop and release new products. That sounds like a big challenge. Um, I'm kind of, I'm pretty familiar with the world of like game monetization in general. And I know that there's a real fine line you have to make between when you're ready to do the upsell and everything. Um, I, I think a big question that our audience is definitely gonna, gonna ask, and I've already seen some really good questions around that business. But what I wanna know is like, what's your strategy for user retention? Like how do you get people coming back to your skill over and over again? I know it's a big question, but I'm curious. Yeah, it depends on the game. Um, and we can see from our stats of how people play our games and what mm -hmm. and what content they use um, and the uh, kind of the times of day and when, and when they come back to play. I think a key thing for a number of the games is to keep the content fresh. Um, so there's always new content for them to explore. So they're not coming to the end of a question set or running out. Um, so there's enough content in there to last somebody who likes to play infrequently, but also someone who wants to play frequently mm -hmm. um, to play a lot as well. We also have quite a lot of leaderboards and competitions within our skills. So we have daily, weekly, monthly, all-time leaderboards as well. So we have some people that email us every month when they're not quite at the top of the leaderboard asking um, if it's real, if they can get to the top. Um, so <laughs> that people do have the challenges and people have started playing against other people so they can see their, their friends that are on the leaderboards as well. We've also introduced some other um, ways. I think there's a shared activities that we're looking at um, doing where you can challenge friends to play against you um, in some of our skills as well. Um, so it's all around making sure there's something there for the user to come back and try again um, and keep increasing their scores. And the social collaborative aspect helps a lot with that too. So people basically can challenge their friends to see if you get a better score or something like that. Exactly that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of your successful games is the Deal or No Deal game. That's the official Deal or No Deal game on Alexa, right? Correct, yes. So what was it like trying to work with a big brand like that? Um, yeah, it's interesting. We um, It was before my time. It was actually um, mm -hmm. probably Richard when he started uh, thought that it would be a great mm -hmm. game for voice. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of games, TV game shows we looked at that would be good for voice. And that was one in particular that we thought would work well. Um, and so we just emailed the uh, company that holds the license rights for them oh. and asked them who, how we went about uh, securing their voice licensing. And at the time, they were like, we don't know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> so they'd licensed it for gaming. They'd licensed it for board games. They'd licensed it for apps. But they hadn't licensed it for voice because... Um, they didn't know what it was. So um, there was a meeting, went along, had a conversation with them, explained um, what it was. It was great at the time. We were working quite closely with the Alexa team in the UK and Amazon. Um, and so they were heavily involved, helping us explain what the, the platform was, where it was going, what we were looking to do. And so we managed to uh, strike up a deal um, and license from the one company uh, that owned the rights for the deal or no deal, um, Pointless, which is a UK TV show, mm -hmm. um, and Tenable, which is a UK TV show, and also 100K drop um, or million dollar drop that's been on, yeah. the, on the TV there as well. So um, there is some challenges that everything has to go through the license holder to be approved. So you build mm -hmm. everything, you have to demo to it, you have to stick to the brand guidelines, um, the certain restrictions about what you can change from the format uh, and what you can't change and the voices that you can use and the... Mm -hmm. Uh, the way you can promote it um, but all in all it's been quite a good partnership we've had the the deals now for quite a long time um, and we've extended them as well so um, and it's all it's great as well to to launch a game that everybody knows um, yeah. and you know people recognize it from tv and they want to play the game and we can have the theme tunes 
and the audio from the from the studio effects as well as well as all the branding um and support from them on that in that regard as well uh it's really cool that they y'all just called them up and said hey who's doing your voice game and they're like well we don't know what that means <laughs> yeah i guess Back i guess very brave who dares wins right just give it a yeah. shot and see who, exactly. there's, no, there's no game for this yet let's see if we can make it yeah um, i think we yeah now now you'd struggle because there's um a lot more licenses out there and i know in the us there's quite a few game shows of the licenses of jeopardy etc as well so it's more of a common um thing but we're in the right place so we do also get approached from other brands as well that want right. to bring their content to see if um, we want to license that content but i think what we've learned over time of building games is it has to be the right game for voice oh, um so that's there's very other interesting tv formats that we've been approached to take um that we haven't taken because trying to make a game or trying to make something that will work well on alexa mm -hmm. um, it is also part of the the consideration as well that's really interesting i want to dig more into that um what makes a game a good candidate for voice i mean is it just a kind of a gut feeling you sit down and figure out like how you'd voice it out and a deal or no deal is very intuitive. I understand right away how that would work in voice. Yeah. So I think there's some game shows that are very visual mm -hmm. where you're interacting with something. Um, and obviously they would only really work for screen-based devices. Mm -hmm. um, and so although we do see a lot more users interacting with our with screen-based devices um, in our games, still the majority is um, voice first. Mm -hmm. um, so there has to be a game that will work just with voice. Um, and also it can't, in our opinion, it can't be too complex. Mm -hmm. um, so getting into playing a game in voice we've had some great ideas for games but they're just too complex for people to kind of understand and play when they don't have a screen-based device with them right because you maybe have to memorize a lot of stuff like the status of a playing field or the status of a board or something like that yeah or playing multi-turn taking a multiplayer game and putting it into a single player because we know a lot of our users will play on their own and right how can we reformat in that way so um, we have tried quite a few. We've got a, a game at the moment that's not a TV show, but it's actually we've licensed it as a board game mm -hmm. um, called Linky, um, which okay. is a great game mm -hmm. where it reads out four clues or questions, and the answers of those questions or clues then uh, come together to form a link. And your the objective is to guess the link between the four questions. Oh. So not only do you need to know to answer the questions, um, you then also need to work the link out between them. Um, but we have to encourage users to get a pen and paper to write down, right. um, to think. And so, although it's a great game and we have some quite big fans that play it regularly every day, um, mm -hmm. the uptake of new users is a lot lower because we just think it's too complex as a format mm -hmm. to kind of get people in to buy in and, uh, when you first play it. And they really probably want to be familiar with the board game to try to play it just so they they'd know the rules already. Yeah, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Uh, I know um, with your discoverability, what you've also done is create uh, kind of like a, a hub for your games, the like Yak Yak Games Hub. Yeah. So we we had a lot of games. We had about um, 20 games that we were promoting individually. And we were using um, kind of our own adverts at the end of the games to say, hey, if you like this game, why don't you say um, Alexa open deal or no deal or Alexa open pointless and trying to mm -hmm. um, drive people to do a prompt to open themselves. Um, so when Skill Connections um, came out, we were invited by the team at Amazon to kind of look at how we could put all of our games together within this kind of connection route. Um, and so we uh, created something called Yak Yak Games, mm -hmm. where you can go there and it's basically talks you through all the games we have um, and offers the games. And then you can choose a game, go off to the game, come back to Yak Yak Games go off to another game and if you go to one of the games directly at the end it would say would you like to play another game you can say yes then you go to yak yak games and you choose your game um and go through and actually we what we also did is bundled up a subscription that if you bought a subscription in yak yak games you could get premium access to all of the other games as well so rather than selling isps individually which we um which you can do in the games if people just want to play one game but for a bundled price you can now play all the games if you become a member of Yak Yak Games. Um, that, does, that, does, that, does that work really well for people? I imagine it's less friction, right? Because it's just the one-time subscription for folks. Yeah, it's less friction. There's still um, a bit, a little bit of friction in, in the messaging between a connection, mm -hmm. where Alexa, you say, would you like to play a game? You say, yes. 
and then Alexa will read out the two skill names and say, are you okay for me to do this? And you mm -hmm. say yes again, and then and you go through. So um, I think we're working, uh, trying to look at how we can streamline that process to make it less kind of cumbersome and friction. But the idea that you can just remember one thing to go to, find the games and pay once and get access, I think is a positive for all. And that, that hub links to the some of the skills you just talked about, right? The deal or no deal, the linky, those are all like on Yak Yak Games Hub. Yeah, Linky, um, what came first is another one where you get given two uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, I think one was Donald Trump or fake tan is a question. Which one came <laughs> first? I think it's Donald Trump. Um, so we've got that. We've got a sports quiz with Jeff Stelling in there, 100K drop or a million dollar drop that we mentioned before. Deal or no deal was part of it as well. Um, got a music game called Song Blast. Um, so I think there's about 10 skills in the Yak Yak Game subscription hub. That you okay, can this is just with. a side question, but I don't know the answer. Is it a 100K drop in the UK and a million dollar drop in the US? Is that? Yeah, you're more generous in the US. We, have, so. we give away more money. Yeah, we, drop we give away 100,000 and you give away a million. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I guess I guess in the US, it's like, it has to be a million or don't even bother. Nobody's yeah, I think it was a million pound drop in the UK, but then they changed it to a, a daily show. So it was on every day. Oh, so and they, then had to give away. they couldn't then do a million pound every day. So they had to reduce That's a lot to, to give away every day. So yeah, but it was on, a, it was on every day um, in the UK. I was just curious because I was, because I've always heard it a million dollar drop because I'm here in yeah. the States. But I didn't realize it was a hundred K in the UK. Yeah. Um, so I want to get to the chat questions, but first of all, as a question I asked you earlier, uh, but I want to be sure to ask it on stream. Um, when your games, um, a lot of them are voice first, right? But you're also doing visuals. So um, what's your balance between using APL versus Web API? What works better in Web API? What works better in APL? Yeah, so we've, uh, we've, we've done both. Um, mm -hmm. We did build quite a big project using Web API when it first came out called Brain Games, mm -hmm. um, which is a multiplayer, uh, in real-time multiplayer game. Um, with a game engine behind it um, and real visuals, and you could create an avatar and a character and customize it yourself and change the colors, the eyes, um, the hair, glasses, everything else. Um, and it only worked on on screen devices as well. So it's one of the mm -hmm. first games where we only put it out to work on screen screen devices as well. So there's a lot of work with that. Um, but, but then more recently, we've gone back to APL. Um, and I'm not techie, so I, I don't know the, the kind of ins and outs of why, but we've managed to, with the advances of APL, mm -hmm. basically create everything that we were doing in Web API, oh. what we needed to do with animations mm -hmm. and screens and loading and making sure the screen doesn't um, kind of go black in between moving layers. We've, we've managed mm -hmm. to do quite a bit of work um, to make the APL experience as good as the uh, Web API. Um, and That's it great. kind of loads a bit quicker and it, it, and it works for us. So most of our projects now we do with APL. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, APL has evolved a lot since we first launched it. So they keep adding new animations and features and motion graphics and stuff to it. So yeah. it doesn't surprise me that you can get everything need, you done that you need to get done. Um, although it just, just depends on the needs of your game because yeah, we exactly, had... Um, yeah. mm -hmm. We had our uh, one of our you know our games team. We had Chris Abaggio on here a couple of weeks ago talking about the Web API and the differences. Um, and you know, for the developers out there that are interested, I always have a game development background, so like I love the game engines, and it's nice intuitive. Like if you already know the game engine, you can easily like you don't have to learn a new code. Um, yeah. But I do think that for the Alexa devices, uh, APL is a little bit lighter in some cases. Like you said, you're going to get a faster load time because it's kind of native to the device versus trying to go through a web. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's nice to see you're getting use out of both. Um, it's 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 cool to see the variety of what people are using in games. Um, I'm going to jump over to chat real quick just to see what people are talking about today. Uh, earlier on, I, Andy Muncy, you're in chat a lot. I, you always have these really cool ideas about is it you know geofencing and Alexa location based skills. We should probably do a location based skill chat. Here at some point that would be interesting i don't think that your business does any location based i think everybody's at, at, with with what you do except for we'll get into the smart property stuff later right yeah. yeah but the game stuff isn't doesn't rely on location anybody can play that on other devices they they do but we do um you can you can play them wherever you release them in different territories and we release some in different languages um mm. uh, they can play but we do change the content 
based on the location that people are playing. Oh, okay. Because, um, I appreciate you probably don't know much about East Enders or Coronation Street or. Right. British I was about to say as as... trivia is very yeah. location based, right? Like it's whatever shows or because like, do you do TV trivia? Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be based on. Okay. So for the US, what kind of TV trivia do y'all ask about? Yeah. So we, so some of our games, we have different question content based on US and mm -hmm. different questions that we get from the TV shows that we're doing. So um, they'll send us over the different content and different music that we play. Obviously what's hot in America isn't always the same in the UK. So um, right. we do have yeah. to localize our content exactly. quite a lot for the US. Yeah, localization isn't just about language, right? It can also be about culture and what people are interested in. So for trivia, I can just imagine there'd be big differences. Yeah, of course, sports. We yeah, we have a lot of folks on here who say football when they mean soccer, or we in the U.S. say soccer. We have football fans from all over the world who, and then I, then we have to stop and go, oh, you mean American football, or do you mean football, footy? <laughs> right? Yeah, we released a, um, a game, a football trivia game or soccer trivia game for the right. World Cup um, that we called Soccer Blast, um, and it was fresh questions every day based on what had happened um, at the football or the soccer World Cup. Um, but yeah, we had some kickback in the UK because we decided to call it soccer. Oh, um, and some people are like, "What are you talking about? It's, it's football." But it's football, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. I, I guess people, it's yeah. But they um, but they watch every Saturday on a, a TV show on the UK on Sky. It's called Soccer Saturday, oh, and it's okay. been going for twenty years. So people are. Uh, I used to call it soccer, but it was interesting that people complained that we called it soccer over football. Some people call it. Some people call it soccer over there. I know it's mostly football. Yeah. Um, uh, so data driven skills has a great question. I want to segue to because I think we can get a lot of we have a good conversation about this. What advice do you have for people who want to sell things through their Alexa skills? And I think uh, we're talking about both ISP and like shopping. Yeah. So we've, we've done both. Um, so for ISPs, I think uh, what we've learned over the time is um, in a skill, you need to have some real value add that people are going to want to um, pay for and nine times out of ten that's probably around the content mm -hmm. and the experience that they can then get more of what they really like and better of what they like um, uh, for that and then also little bits that we put in there like access to leaderboards access to more content access to play more frequently um, mm -hmm. access to challenge other people a whole host of different things that you think are the the key bits in your skill that people really want would be willing to pay extra for mm -hmm. um, in there and with shopping we have uh, worked with a board game company where we've built a, a sample of the types of questions that you'll get in the board game and then you can link through and buy that board game if you like the content oh, cool. using Alexa shopping um, from there which works well mm -hmm. um, and people when we have made sales not huge not huge sales in there but they're mm -hmm. um, it was at the time when it was in uh, beta and it was coming through and we, we tested it um, mm -hmm. and it was there. So I think if you can find something that gives people the experience in the skill that they can do, and then there is a physical product that links to it, it's a nice way for people to try a board game or try the types of questions as an example, and then go and make that purchase through Amazon. Interesting. So in terms of ISP, would you say ISP like in skill purchasing is kind of the bigger money maker for you right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And some of the skills that you have, are they basically like, say you'd have a limited amount of time to play the skill every day. And then you'd say, like, if you want more trivia questions, go ahead and subscribe. Yeah. Different, different um, games have different structures mm -hmm. to how we uh, do that. Some, we let people play once a day. Mm -hmm. And then if they want to play more, they need to come back. Mm -hmm. Others, we limit the content. So you can play these types of questions or these categories. But if you want to do more or unlock more content, you need to come back um, and play. We have smaller versions of games as opposed to larger versions of games. So there's kind of uh, smaller pieces. So yeah, it's all really around what we managed and give away to a user to kind of entice them in to play. Um, but our end goal as a business is to then get them to subscribe or make a purchase. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because early on you didn't have to rely on ISP because of the reward system. <clears throat> Do you find that when you sit down to design a game, say you're going to, because this is, this is what I discovered, you know, when I was working on games way back when 
do you kind of start to have to think about the monetization sort of early on in the practice of designing now? Like you have to decide, okay, well, what are we going to charge for? Let's make that part of the plan up front. Yeah. So first of all, it's, it's, um, if we're going to make a game, is it fun? Do we think it's going to work? Are people mm -hmm. going to play it? Mm -hmm. Um, and then if it kind of passes those tests that we have that, yeah, we can do that. Then it's certainly a question of, okay, how do we structure this? What's free and what's the premium features that we think we need to put behind that kind of paywall for people. So we need enough to get them interested and hooked into the game, mm -hmm. but then we want them to want more and find a, a mechanic that gives them more. What's your play test practice for deciding if a game is fun in voice? How do you figure out if it's fun? Uh, we kind of play them. So we make them up. Together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we just, um, we'll come up with a format and chat mm -hmm. it through and then just run through um, in the office with somebody playing the game with other people kind of watching and, and chucking ideas in. Mm -hmm. And you can normally tell very quickly if it's a fun idea or mm -hmm. whether you think it's actually this is a bit complex or someone doesn't get it or there's not too much or it's too easy um, mm -hmm. for that. So, you know, a great example of that is um, kind of like Song Blast, which mm -hmm. is a uh, music uh, game. Right. You know, everyone before Alexa came out would always play a song and say, guess this song mm -hmm. um, from there. So it's a great format. So, you know, it works. Other ones we have is um, we have a game called Voice Blast where mm -hmm. you we play a snippet of a celebrity voice and you have to guess who it is. Okay. That's a format that's worked well on radio for mm -hmm. years of um, or sounds. Can you guess the sound? So those types of, of skills work well. Mm -hmm. And then trivia formats are, yes, you have to have good questions. Mm -hmm. um, you can answer, but also the format of how does the game work? Is there some kind of jeopardy in there? Is there mm -hmm. a challenge? Do you have lives? Do you lose lives? Do you get extra points for getting it quick? Do you do something in this way? So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, we kind of just play games or, or make That's... up games ourselves. And do you imagine, do you have somebody play the role of Alexa in that case and just pretend to be Alexa and answer the question the way yeah. Alexa would? Yeah. Someone will yeah. become Alexa and ask the questions. And that's the hardest thing when they try to then explain how the game should, like, if someone's stuck, obviously Alexa can't do that. So right. they kind of sit mute until they're prompted to say something and other people kind of figure it out. But that's good learning because then we also work mm -hmm. out how we need to prompt people. Yeah, I, I think that would be a useful, and I know we've said this on the show before, but it's a useful exercise for any kind of skill. To yeah. just have somebody sit there and pretend to be Alexa for a minute and see what they say if you ask them something unexpected or, oh, well, I guess somebody would ask that question. Yeah. Um, well, that, yeah. Why are they doing that? That's not what we're supposed to do. Why are they saying that? <laughs> that like, we haven't prompted them in the right way. It probably saves you time in the end, you know, actually development with you if you write down all these things ahead of time or even record. Do you ever like film or record? the? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Really useful stuff. Um, so he has a follow-up question. Uh, forgive me for asking for how profitable is your game business. You don't have to answer that. But I do think this other question, I mean, it, it's up to you. But this other question is useful. What do you suggest for someone who wants to break into that market? Into the games market, you think? Yeah, into the games market. Um, I think it's, uh, I was actually, you mentioned as well, Tom Hewitson's blog post, which I read as well. In, yeah. Yeah, which is yes. all about... Um, uh, what to how to come up with coming up with a format of, of a skill that you want to mm -hmm. develop and release um i think it you need to look at what's popular mm -hmm. um in the alexa skill store or in voice and what people are playing and what people have good reviews and formats that people like so you need to make sure that whatever game you think will be great is there something similar is there someone already doing it is there others that aren't exactly the same but it kind of work if they're not there why aren't they there um is it is that a format that would work as well um and i think testing and uh researching at, like we do and saying actually do you think this is a good game you don't need to build anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. code wise to actually play a game that right. you could play on alexa to then see if people really like it um from there um then once you build it, one of the biggest challenges uh, that we faced at the beginning um, is actually how do people discover your game mm -hmm. when it's out there? So you can have an amazing game and launch it, but you need to tell people about it um, and get there. If you haven't got a big budget to put behind marketing it, you need to look at other channels. We're quite fortunate that we've been doing it for a long time, so we have quite a big audience now that when we release a new game, we can promote that game to our audience. We do um, account linking, so we have 
a lot of our customers do tell us that we can contact them as well. Um, we're lucky that we've been featured in um, the Alexa emails that go out as well to drive audience. Um, and with our Yak Yak game skill connections, we're able to connect through to other games mm -hmm. that we have when we do it. So um, I think having a great product in the format is, is it, yeah. uh, making sure that it works. But yeah, that discovery is, I think, is still the biggest challenge. Yeah. for a new game that comes if especially if it's not a brand if it's a brand like deal or no deal you've got an audience there and you can work with them to let people know it's on alexa but if, if it's not a brand um that would still be the biggest challenge to get there yeah we had that question um on the twitch chat too from patel abjit saying what's your biggest challenge you faced um i think you kind of just hinted on it discoverability is a big challenge what else would you consider a big challenge of working in the alexa business um i think uh, as a business, we still find monetization a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, we still have a lot of users that don't pay anything to us for playing our games that we're still trying to work out um, <laughs> why. I think if we look at other models that we've had, um, and we build games on other platforms as well, so we've built some app games and we've mm -hmm. built some uh, web-based games as well. Obviously, we can generate income from free players right. um, with, with advertising in those. Right. Um, at the moment, that's not uh, available on Alexa, so um that challenge still is uh, monetizing all of your users in a way um that makes it worthwhile having free users as well as paid for users it's yeah we talk about a lot yeah and i think just like as a level set for the games the games world in general uh if you have like a freemium style product you can only expect a small fraction of your users to convert to paid so it does yeah. depend on like having that big user base to have the folks that are going to convert to paid. And that's just pretty, pretty typical pattern of freemium across the board. So yeah. yeah, definitely something to keep in mind if you're getting into the games business that if you have a product where it's working with like in-app purchases, it's, it's like, it's definitely takes that extra mile to make sure you get people to convert. Sometimes it doesn't yeah. work. Um, <laughs> Driven skill says hand egg ball. Yeah, that's that's gridiron. I like the word gridiron though. That's not too bad, right? We could all call it gridiron. Gridiron is that American football? Mm -hmm. American football. Yeah. yeah, hand egg ball is the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much does the media in the game, aka sound effects, visuals, play into your games? Now you do voiceover and music and stuff like that for your games. It's not just Alexa's text to speech, right? No, we use. Um... We use as much audio, sound effects, uh, stings, uh, voiceover in a game to kind of make it a rich audio experience um, as we can. And obviously for all of our games as well, we uh, create visuals for all the screen-based devices as well. So we're quite rich um, in the uh, visual side as well for what we create. I think that makes it important. We do use um, Alexa quite a lot as well, her voice, um, especially in trivia to ask questions. Um, because recording a voiceover of all the questions and all the answers in the and that uh, can be quite um, It'd be a lot costly and also as you're updating new content regularly you, you want to be doing that so we use Alexa to kind of do dynamic content um, and we also like to build in that Alexa is part of the uh, one of the presenters hosts so for example in pointless it will the host will say hello welcome to pointless i'm joined by my co-host alexa alexa will say hello richard how are you and he'll sound very well thank you alexa good to have you here today can we have the first question yes sure richard the first question is so we kind of build an interplay between the two so it makes mm -hmm. it feel like it's all a, a seamless they're working together oh that's really clever um, so you would say that having up-to-date content is probably more important necessarily than having the voiceover piece just to be sure the content is refreshed yeah i think you want to be uh putting fresh content in all the time and that the easiest way for us to do that is to be able to just generate that and have an alexa read the content um from there really cool um user on linkedin asks what do you think separates your game from other games on the platforms what makes you successful i think big question yeah big question i think um we're big on visuals Mm -hmm. um, so we want to make sure that if people are playing on screen-based devices, um, it looks good um, and it's intuitive. Um, and I think also uh, sound effects are great, but also that it works really well. So we spend a lot of time on testing on synonyms or making sure that we're understanding different answers. Um, we try and avoid 
uh, people having to say A, B, or C as a trivia question, or one, two, and three. Um, so we, for example, we might ask, um, what football team did Ronaldo play for in the Premier League? Um, and the answer is Manchester United, but we'll allow people to say May United, United, the Red Devils, the Mighty Reds, Manchester, the Red Team. So they can give answers around that because we know that not everybody's going to say the exact answer that you think is in your skill. So right. of, um, the experience is making sure that it works, that you understand, that you have synonyms in there. Um, and Nothing's more frustrating than having the right answer and saying what you think is the right answer and it's saying, no, we, we meant crimson, not red, or whatever, something yeah. very similar to that. Yeah. Oh, and exactly. I noticed that all I see is LinkedIn user on my little thing, but it's Ethan Richardson. Hi, how are you? Thank you for joining us today on the show. Um, another developer of wonderful visuals for <laughs> Yes, APL. I've spoken to him before, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so... Got to the bottom of my questions. I am going to pivot slightly because I promised that I would also ask about your work with Alexa Smart Properties. So could yeah. you, that's a total pivot from the game's entertainment, but I want to ask about it. Um, how? Let's talk about Alexa Smart Properties. This is some new stuff that we're rolling out um, and you're part of that program. So what are you working on in the Smart Properties world? Yeah, so we started working with Smart Properties team in the UK last year. Um, and we were part of the launch of Senior Living that officially launched in November of last year mm -hmm. here in the UK. So we're working with a number of care organisations um, and deploying um, Alexa devices into uh, care home facilities um, and into kind of residential care living to enable the residents to interact with their device to do everything you would expect on an Alexa to do um, so to answer questions um, they play our games so that's mm -hmm. one of our, our key things is that we enabled our games they have some kind of entertainment um, level there as well um, but also what smart properties allows you to do that you couldn't do before is manage um, uh, kind of fleet manage your devices so mm -hmm. we've worked with some care facilities that had individually bought consumer devices and put them in because they saw the benefits of Alexa uh -huh. they had to set up Amazon accounts for all the devices um, and they'd all be linked and so people could in theory buy things off them when they didn't want them to but mm -hmm. also um, some of the residents would say something like broadcast radio one instead of play radio one and then all the devices connected to that account would start playing the radio at two in the morning um, because they're all linked up otherwise oh oh my goodness that would yeah, be so, <laughs> so everybody's Alexa tech cards on yeah, so Smart Properties enables you under one account mm -hmm. to manage mm -hmm. thousands of devices and deploy them as individuals. You can then also preload uh, content um, through a system that we've built so that people can ask questions. So in a care facility, what time is lunch? What's on the menu? What activities mm -hmm. are happening? Um, without having to invoke a skill beforehand. So instead of saying, Alexa, open the care home skill and then ask the question, you can just ask a question. Right. And Alexa will, will intercept that and then we'll provide the answer to them. And they can also use it to call people. So their relatives with video calling. So call my brother, call my son, call my daughter um, to have that connection and request assistance as well. I need some assistance. I've dropped something. My blind's not working. And so they can update that into their uh, other systems in the, in the property to manage that. So we thought it was uh, when I joined um, mm -hmm. four years ago, mm -hmm. um, I actually said, why don't we put this into hotel rooms and meeting rooms? Right. Because I'd come from a events business with thousands of people staying in a hotel and going, it would be great to be able to update them in the morning or get questions or share audio files with them to do that. Um, and uh, I remember someone in the Amazon team going, oh, that's interesting. We're, we're looking at that. That was four years ago. Um, so when it came out, we were like, yeah, this is a great use case. Um, and more so in the senior living space because um, I've seen firsthand with my own uh, mother how actually Alexa can add real value um, into that kind of age category as well of just playing the radio or using it as a phone call or asking a question rather than to get a phone out um, and put your glasses on and try and see and touch and type actually Alexa is great so we can see real benefits every time we deploy these now people are um, seeing the real value add to them. That's great. Yeah, we, we have some people in the chat not, not familiar with the program. I think we have talked a little bit about Smart Properties before, but Smart Properties focuses on um, elder care, it focuses on hospitality, and on medical. 
So there's like three different spheres in which that lives. And senior living is, you know, kind of an intersection of hospitality and medical because you kind of have both needs with senior living. Am I right? Yeah. So that, yeah. a good example, as you just said, like if somebody needs assistance in their room, um, in the case of senior living, is it is it more like uh, in some cases, is it individual homes? Because like, for example, sometimes they're like independent living versus like living in like more of a confined space. Yeah, so it's a bit of, but so mm -hmm. some are care home facilities where people all live and there's like 50, 60, 70 bedrooms. Uh, mm -hmm. People have a, a room in there. Mm -hmm. Others are kind of independent living, but within a community. So they might have the ability, someone might come and check on them once a day. Um, right. And other people receive what um, we call in the UK uh, domiciliary care. So they stay in their own home mm -hmm. um, and a carer comes to visit them. But actually we can deploy a device into their home that they can use to communicate with their care as well and in the case of those like individual homes it's an alexa smart properties so they if they still have a question they don't necessarily have to invoke a specific skill right correct yeah so what times my care are coming or can you ask my carer to do this um oh, they don't really? have to invoke a skill but then they can use all the skills that they normally would on a normal alexa device and still play music play the radio get the weather see what's on tv control the smart home which is quite um good as well turn the tv on turn the lights on we can configure all that through the portal that we've created for them to do that so it just kind of sits in there and this is a bit of added comfort that it's got answers to the questions they would normally be waiting to find the answers to um and you're you're you were involved in the aging and engaging hackathon as well right last year yeah. you want to talk a little bit about what you made for that yeah so as part of um that came about when we started working with senior living um and actually with our games we're speaking to a lot of care providers around how uh, brain health at the moment is really important and a lot of mm -hmm. studies into brain health and how um, when we deploy our devices, actually users are encouraged to do puzzles, do challenges, do quizzes, do trivia to kind of keep their brain active. So we redesigned um, one of our games, Brain Games, that I spoke about before, which is a numbers, uh, words, letters, memory challenge um, to make it more suited uh for people in their senior years um mm -hmm. and as a daily challenge to kind of do some arithmetic and do some kind of word challenges um and then keep your score and see if you're improving um over time and then you can share that score with family members to see if people are engaging in the skill and if they're improving or if there's a decline and then the idea being over a period of time and a lot of users and a lot of studies we could then look at uh could this be used to highlight potential um, challenges that people might face or certain points in a, in a journey where some intervention might be needed or a question might be raised? Um, Interesting. Interesting stuff. So this is a sort of technical question. I don't know. I don't know if you know or not. Um, it seems like you would need, this is from Milton Huang on Twitch. It seems like you would need a very large database to localize the answers down to the level of each device. Um, and that's a feature of smart properties, right? managing the device level like that yeah so we we've built our own proprietary software that, that manages it that we can then design um manage a device id and know yeah. that if this person asks a question this is the answer we'll give them so yeah the database does need to be big and the content doesn't need, need to be populated to manage for individual needs as well as group needs as well so it's very personalized. So I imagine they ask a lot of questions when they're onboarding, right? Um, Ethan had that question. It's a great follow-up. What's on? What's involved in onboarding someone into a senior living? Yeah, it's a good question. How do they know what to say? We do recommend and we do deploy uh, screen devices, so Echo Show 8s. Okay. Um, and we have the ability to take control of that screen to prompt people of things they can ask and they can say. Um, so this device will be rotating through with uh, different things that the device can help them with. Um, and we also print some collateral that stands by every device with prompts of things to try. Um, but of course, the first question in the skill is, what can I do? So Alexa, mm -hmm. what can I do? And Alexa will start prompting you of things that you can do and you can try right. Right. from there as well. So it's, it, start, it tries to be onboarding the user in the most basic way that it's kind of self-taught and intuitive and, and kind of learned through the, through the speaking to the device. Have you had to add any special accessibility features to these? Yeah, we do. We worked with um, uh, one of the centers we deployed in was uh, for blind veterans. It was with Amazon um, as well. 
Um, and so we have like put the uh, tone every time Alexis, rather than the blue light coming in um, to do it. So we've got the tone in there as well. And there's other features that we can uh, put for them as well. So yeah, we try and do as much of the accessibility features in the devices um, for the users. Yeah, it must be really useful for folks that are blind. I mean, they won't be able to see your like how to access it, but to get on board and be able to talk to somebody, that's got to be handy, right? Yeah, and in there, we uh, every room um, you can ask how to get somewhere, and we give them individual directions based on where they've wow. asked. So, how do I get to the dining room? If you're in room seven, we'll tell you to come out of your door and turn left to the lift, go down. Whereas if you're in room twenty-one, it'll say come out the door and turn right. Um, from there and we actually put devices around the property so in the corridors or by the lifts you can actually ask the device there as well oh my gosh that's so cool we were just you know that ties back to that question earlier about location right so these devices are in a specific location or they're aware of their location so you really are creating like an ambient audio scape for people who need to ask a device yeah and we're trying to work with them to uh, onboard as many questions as we can as many topics and the way people ask the questions um, from there, so uh, when they um, when they arrive, when they're put into their room, they're kind of shown by the staff how this works and the questions they can ask. Um, okay. But we try to make it they can ask as many questions as possible, um, mm -hmm. and we provide an answer to it. Or if we don't know the answer, we'll tell them how to contact reception, and they can do that through the Alexa device as well. The question in, on Twitch: How do you keep the onboarding data gathering from being boring? I imagine it's not that much, right? Is it boring to tell Alexa all my data? <laughs> no, um, we we build it in a conversational way. So mm -hmm. um, we try and make the experience so um, uh, in the tone and the phrase of how we provide the answers from there. But yeah, there is a lot of data gathering when we on board with a new client because obviously they're telling us everything that somebody could potentially ask them um, and how they want that to be answered. But so it's, it's kind of a friendly chat with Alexa telling you about your preferences and such, and she tells you what she can do. Yeah. Really exactly. cool. Uh, this is just a personal question for me as an Alexa developer. When you have two devices that are like in two different rooms like that, do you ever run into a problem where it doesn't know which device you're talking to? And is there a way to disambiguate that? It can, because obviously um, they're on different, they're identified as different accounts in effect. So they don't know they're talking to one or the other. Right. So we can change the name. Um, but also we look at where we position them mm -hmm. in the rooms. So they're not near the doors, um, right. they're kind of away. So yeah, when that's part of the, uh, mm -hmm. especially in a care facility when rooms are next to each other, similar right. in hotel rooms, you just need to position them in a way and control the volume on them. Right, so you're not in a, in a care facility. So I, I'm talking to the one by the elevator that knows I need to step on, I need to go this way. I wouldn't want to accidentally talk to the one in the room behind me that belongs to somebody else. Exactly, yeah. So it's just about how we position them. Um, in the different rooms. Very cool. That just seems like such a great feature. I'm looking forward to seeing that rolled out in so many hotels all over the world as well and seeing like yeah. it, just convenient to be able to say, hey, we need towels <laughs> and not yes. have to like call the desk and all that stuff. Yeah, so. or ask for a late checkout or mm -hmm. um, find out what time the pool is or order room service. Yeah, all that kind of stuff can be done. Mm -hmm. um, wow, this has been a really great conversation. It feels like this hour just flew by. Um, we would love to know, like, before we go, um, what are you most excited about this coming year with Alexa? What are you going to be working on next? And what's going to be the future for you? Wow. Um, so at the moment, our focus is uh, quite a lot of my time and focus is on the smart properties. Mm -hmm. um, and it obviously launched in November in the UK. So we're kind of still early days. So we're just um, speaking to a lot of people. Um, onboarding uh, quite a lot of different clients, meeting people, showcasing. So that's a real focus for us this year to get as many devices um, out as we can. Our games are still um, top of our list. So we're actually undertaking a couple of rebuilds of games um, with new visuals that are going to be coming um, this summer. Uh, and we're looking at different monetization uh, tactics in, in them as well. So yeah, the two main focuses are really our smart properties and kind of still building our audience in games. Very cool, very cool. I'm, I'm excited to hear how the, the smart properties rollout uh, works works for you and how that continues to evolve because it just seems like such an exciting space to be in uh, when you're helping people, making people's lives easier, maybe disabled folks. It's just 
it really warms my heart to hear these stories. So it's, it's awesome yeah. to hear. Um, I see, by the way, there's been a little bit of back and forth in the chat about uh, some abbreviations in Portuguese. This is so interesting. Uh, we didn't, I didn't address that just because we were, we were in the middle of our conversation, but I would like to thank our developers tag team on YouTube there for helping us out and talking about how we can get more information. Um, if you ever, let me see if I can, let me see if I can find it. If you have any feedback for us, uh, don't forget that we have contact us. They have posted it in the chat. So if you ever want to go to contact us and talk about a feature request or talk about what some, what's not working in your specific skills. Um, and don't forget as well, you can join us on Slack. We have a great community there that I can put on the screen so I can do that. All right. I'm still learning these buttons. So uh, for anybody who wants to join us on Slack and continue the conversation. Um, and thank you so much um, for being here today. Like one more couple, couple more questions. Uh, where, where are you based out of? So our office where I am today is in Guildford, which is about mm -hmm. um, half an hour south of London mm -hmm. in the UK. Um, so that's where I am today. I actually live down on the south coast in Portsmouth by the sea. Um, oh, our office is in Guildford where I am today. Oh. And I saw another question about the blog. Actually, we have that in chat. Chat, could y'all post the Tom Hewitson blog on the chat on the chat one more time so we can see that? But that blog just went up yesterday and it's from another one of our great Alexa developer champions uh, talking about getting started and like building your first skills and figuring out what to build and all that. So um, yeah, wonderful. Yep, that's the blog. Thank you so much for posting that again. Um, gosh, we're almost at time. Is there anything else you want to say to our audience today or talk about before we call it a show? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think um, it's been interesting. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for um, being here. Excited to I kind of watch these. Excited to see what everyone else is doing on the on the Alexa platform, and obviously excited to see new features that are constantly be rolling out. You mentioned widgets at the beginning. We just released our first widgets as well. So we're interested to see how they how they go. You just published your first widget. Is there a Yak Yak Games widget we can all try? There is a Song Blast widget that you oh, can wonderful. try. And there will soon be a Yak Yak Games widget coming soon, yes. Wonderful. Well, if you haven't tried it, check out the Song Blast widget. Um, that'll give us a start for widgets. And I hope to see more from call it in the future and all the cool stuff that you all are making so thank you so much for joining us on the show today thank you very um, much thank you um folks uh next week we're going to have another great show for you it's going to be jeff talking to uh helen and melissa about our all course so um if you want to know more about how we develop that course tune in they'll be happy to explain to you and please give the course a try or wait and after the talk give the course a try either way it's great but Thanks, Rob, for being on the show today. Uh, it was so awesome having you. Um, I've had a lot of fun. And now I'm going to figure out how to end the stream. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care.